Hi, everybody. Um, cool. So this is the second last slot of the conference. So well done. We've, we're, we're almost there, and it's almost time for beer. So just hold on one, a little bit more. Um, so I'm not sure. Did, did anybody here see Bern Rucker's talk yesterday called uh, Lost in Translation? OK, I assume somebody did. Um, but in any case, so yeah, that was a really cool talk. Uh, and he was talking about how to, um, how to achieve consistency in, in distributed systems using um, state machines and orchestration. Uh, and this talk actually overlaps with that quite a lot. And so it's basically about how we at Luno build our microservices and distributed logic in such a way that it's um, robust to failure and easy to understand and maintain. And we just do it a bit differently by embracing the dual nature of state. But before we get into that, a little bit about myself. My name is Kor Ferruas. I'm staff software engineer at Luno. And we are a cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency wallet and exchange. Um, you might have seen the little uh, Luno first around. Uh, and so if you stick around at the end, we might have a small surprise. So what do we do at Luna? We're basically uh, an exchange in a wallet, and we allow you to buy, sell, and store cryptocurrencies. And obviously, we are hiring. So, <laughs> by the way, um, so some more context. One size does not fit all. I think it depends where you are as a business, um, what kind of scale you're facing. That'll influence the kind of architecture that you use. So if you're a startup. What, I'm, what I'll describe here might be a bit too much. And obviously, if you're one of the big boys, this solution might not scale enough. But for us, it's really great. <clears throat> and the reason is that we are going through a hyperscaling phase. That means that the team, the engineering team, is doubling every six months to nine months. And that means that half the team is brand new. They're new to the company, they're new to microservices, they're new to Go, because most of the engineers that we hire don't know any Go. And so it's what, what's really important to us is simplicity, uh, maintainability, and um, what's the other one? Consistency. <laughs> uh, so basically, you know, a new engineer comes in, and he should be able to look at a microservice, understand it, figure it out, extend it. And he should also be able to write a new microservice in such a way that when the next guy comes around, they can also um, work on it. And yeah, so just some numbers. We've got millions of customers, not hundreds of millions. We've got thousands of requests, not millions. We've got hundreds of microservices, not thousands. And we've got tens of distributed teams, not hundreds. So give you an idea of where we are. So it was a dark and stormy night. And we have our little sender microservice going about its business. So I'll use this as an example uh, throughout, the, throughout the talk, this sender service. And so let me explain what it does. So as a cryptocurrency wallet, we, we allow customers to send transactions on the blockchain, right? So they would open the app, um, select the currency they want to send, type in the address or paste in the address, type in an amount, and click Send. So that send request would be received by our enthusiastic service here. Um, it would save the request in the DB, and then respond to the customer saying, your send is pending. Asynchronously, it will uh, process the send, it will broadcast it on the blockchain, and then at the end, it will update the state of the send to completed or failed, depending on, on what happened. Cool, so that's, that's pretty simple, right? What can go wrong? Um, and as Bernd also said yesterday, many things can go wrong. So when we broadcast the send on the blockchain, um, our blockchain nodes might, uh, you know, the disk might be full, and it might error. Uh, there might be network issues on the request or on the response, or our CI/CD system might actually, at that moment, deploy the sender service, uh, you know, interrupting it wherever it is. And uh, but more problematic would be is you could actually send out the transaction. It might go out on the blockchain, but you might, um, you might, be, you might fail before you actually update the state to completed. And obviously, that's a big problem. And so what now? 
How does one recover from that? Um, so if you're lucky, you can just restart the service and, it, and everything uh, will be fine. If you're unlucky, you might have to do some manual cleanup. You might have to go into the database. The, the send might be stuck and you need to check whether it was sent or not. Uh, and if you're really unlucky, you might have sent out the transaction twice, um, losing money. So, so this is really about how we design a sender service in such a way that it's robust to all these kind of failures. Cool, so getting to this idea of embracing the dual nature of state. Um, and basically, it's the two sides. You've got mutable state on the one side, which is what we all do on a daily basis. You, would, you store domain entities in a MySQL database or in a SQL DB, uh, and you update it over time. But then what we do is we couple that tightly with immutable events. And that's basically taking each change in that, each mutation of the data and storing it as an immutable event in the, in the same database. And we found that this is a really powerful um, architecture. More practically speaking, this talk will be covering the following points. So we'll start off with mutable state, looking at the pros and cons. And then we'll see how we use state machines to, to control the life cycle of our mutable state and how that mitigates a lot of the problems of, of mutable state. We'll then go on to how we couple immutable events um, in the same database to basically create a record of all the changes. Um, what we then do is we expose this, these immutable tables as um, event streams via gRPC, which allows any other service in our system to subscribe to these events and react to them. And then we'll go into how we build our application logic as idempotent consumers, which is really robust to, to, to failures. And finally, uh, we'll go into how we, well, how we explicitly introduce failures in our application logic, at which point you become confident that you can uh, recover from any of these failures. Cool, so first off, mutable, mutable state. So mutable, mutable just means, mutable state means that it, it's state that's stored in, in the database and it's updated after, you, after it's been created. So standard CRUD, um, standard CRUD, yeah. The, why is this cool or why is this good? It's because we understand it. We use it on a, on a daily basis, coming from other languages, we're used to it. Um, and the reason is, well, I think, is because it mimics the real world. We see the real world as changing over time while kind of staying the same. The other benefit of mutable state is that it's trivial to query the current state of the system. If you, think, if you want to go into the history, it gets a bit tricky, but the current state is right there and, and available. Um, Cool, so here we have our sender service. It's storing sends in the DB, and this is what the struct would look like. Obviously, the send itself has an ID. Uh, there's a user ID who's trying to send it, the amount they're trying to send, the address they're sending to, and then we have some fields that'll change over time, our mutable, mutable fields. Uh, status, so when we create the send, it starts in the pending state, and then it will be updated to, to completed or failed and we have a transaction ID which will set if the, trans if the send was successful, and there's an error field which will set if the send failed. Now you can, this seems quite simple, but as, as the number of states grow and as the number of fields increase, it's really, it's really easy to lose track of what's going on here. Which state transitions are allowed? Um, which field should I update in which, in, in which uh, transition? Um, so it, it, it can really get messy over time. So, as Boromir always says, one does not simply mutate state. And what we do is we, um, we control our mutable state with state machines. And so a state machine is pretty much in a way to explicitly control the life cycle of your state. You can see here at the bottom, you know, uh, a send will start in the pending state and it, will and it will either go to failed or completed. 
So by the way, this is a, this is a rooted directed graph for all the mathematicians out there. Um, and also, as Ben mentioned in his talk yesterday, this is really easy for us to understand. It's intuitive. If you look at, at, at the state machine definition, um, he said that, it, that it's like living documentation in the code. So the documentation and the code really start merging, at, um, which makes it easy for us to, to reason about. Um, so even if we go and we... Um, um, even if we change our state machine, let's say we add a reset feature, um, it's quite simple as well. So we can see that we go from failed back to pending via the resetting state, and possibly in the resetting state we might clear the error message or we might do some preparatory work uh, for it to go out again. And you'll see that we added a, a created state at the start, and that's just because our state machines don't allow cycles back into the initial state. But the really powerful thing is about, about state machines is that it decouples complex processes into discrete steps. So in the previous example, we didn't actually need to change our pending state processor, even though we added a resetting state and even though we added a new state at the beginning. It was decoupled and it could just keep on working. Let me just see here. Cool. And then um, what becomes really evident is that transitions are now explicit. All these arrows, um, they're first class citizens, and what leads naturally from that is that we can insert events for each, each transition. OK, and how does this actually look, look in code? So we wrote um, a little library called Shift. Uh, it's on GitHub if you want to go have a look. And it's basically a way to define it. Well, it provides an API to define simple persistence layer state machines on top of your mutable state table. So here we can see the state machine for our uh, sender service. Uh, we just go shift new state machine. And we start with the pending state. That's our initial state. We've got a struct which contain our initial fields. I think it's the user ID, uh, the address, and the amount. It'll be inserted in the, into the pending state, and then, so, and then the last two fields are which, which are the next allowed states which is completed and failed. And then we continue. We say, okay, so there's also the completed state and our completed struct. The completed struct will just have the transaction ID that we set if it's successful, and we've got the failed state and the failed struct, and the failed struct will just have a, um, will have the error message that you said if it fails. So yeah, that's quite explicit. Now you can, it's, it's right there, it's in the code, it's like living documentation, it's really great. Uh, Shift itself doesn't do any of the persistence, it basically just validates transitions and validates the data associated with the transition. And so your structs, uh, the pending, completed, and failed structs, should implement either the inserter or an updater interface, which, which is the actual part where the database transactions um, are done. And so we wrote a little code generator called ShiftGen that that will generate the SQL boilerplate and uh, SQL queries uh, for you. So pretty much all you need, and you have a state machine. Oh, and then lo uh, what it also does is you'll see it, it also takes an events um, object, and that is it's basically just a reference to our events table, and it will insert events with each transition as well. Cool. So moving on, we've got our immutable events. So immutable, uh, it's obviously it's the opposite of mutable, and it means um, things that are not changed. So after, after state is created, you never update it. So in terms of CRUD, it's the C, create, and R. We don't U and we don't D. Um, events, on the other hand, can be quite a, a vague concept. I mean, there's many different... Events is just vague. Um, so Martin Fowler has this really uh, interesting blog post called uh, what do you mean by event-driven, where he outlines different types of event architectures 
And the two main ones he, uh, um, he mentions is event sourcing and event notification. I'm not going to go too much into event sourcing. I think everybody has at least heard of it, but it basically contains immutable state at the, at the base. So instead of having mutable tables, your, your source of truth is built up out of little, all the deltas, all the small changes to the system. Um, and it's a really powerful ar architecture, and on our day-to-day -day lives, uh, we work with such systems, such as Git. Git, um, the state is built out of each commit, uh, and obviously the blockchain, um, it's built out of each block. And then on the other hand, we've got uh, event notification. So obviously, since we use mutable state, we use event notification. And in this case, events are pure notifications. They, are, they tell you that something happened. And it does not contain any data, really. It's just a pointer that something happened. And that means that if you get such, a, such an event, you probably have to go and fetch the data from the, from the source if you want more if you want more information. So the, our event structs look like this, also quite simple. The event has an ID. Uh, it's got a timestamp, a foreign ID, which is the thing that changed. And in our case, it we, would be our strength, send structs ID. And it has a type, or the, the change type. Uh, and in this case, it would just be the status of our send. So it, either pending, or created, or failed. Um, cool, let's see. Um, right, so if you're going to do events, what's really important is persistence guarantees. I mean, you can't you, we can't have a mutation in our system without an associated event in our events table. That's just unacceptable. That means that we'll miss that mutation um, if we subscribe to the events. Similarly, we can't have an event without a mutation. So, because that's just incorrect. You'll think that something changed, but actually it didn't. So the aim is really to have um, exactly one event uh, per mutation, and possibly, I mean, having multiple events for the same mutation in, in worst case is also, is also possible. And since we use shift, and since we use SQL, and since our immutable events and um, mutable state are two tables in the same database, we can use SQL transactions that provide exactly one's event persistence guarantees. And that's a really good, great place to be. If you, are, if you start with that kind of exactly one semantics as your source of truth, um, you have a source of truth that's, that's actually true. Um, so once you have this table of immutable, event no um, of, Im of immutable notification events, what do we do with it? Well, you stream it. So a stream is basically, you can take anything that's an order, depend only log, and, and convert it in, into a stream. Um, and so consumers are basically uh, pieces of logic that process um, events from the stream sequentially, one after each other. And the consumer does so by keeping a cursor of its position in the stream. So an architecture that really made this popular is Kafka, um, and it's proven to be really powerful. So streams are kind of like queues, except that they're not, and they're better. So queues are mutable. If I consume something from a queue, it's gone. It's not on the queue anymore. While, on stream, while the stream is immutable, the events in the stream never change, and consumers just update their cursor, and so consumers are just at different points in the stream. So that means if you want multiple consumers um, consuming from the same queue, you can't, and you, ac you actually have to duplicate your queue while with streams, you can add as many consumers as you want. Uh, they're always decoupled, uh, but they just each have to manage their own uh, cursor, their own position in the queue. So, if, so, okay, so what this implies is that consumers consuming events from the queue, if they encounter an error, you basically have two options. You can um, 
you can update your cursor and, and, and basically ignore the, ignore the error. Say, okay, I'm, I'm fine with this, and I, and I continue processing. But in most cases, you probably just want to keep your cursor where it is and reprocess the event. Yeah, and so similar to persistence guarantees, delivery guarantees are really critical when you're designing a stream implementation. Exactly once delivery guarantees is kind of the holy grail, um, I don't really think it's practically possible. There's a lot of papers about it, um, so I'm just going to ignore it for now. At most, once guarantees is basically unacceptable, right? I can't, I can't sometimes receive an event and, and other times not. Uh, because then I'll miss events. So most streaming libraries provide you with a um, at least once delivery semantics, which means that you'll, under normal conditions, you'll receive all the events, uh, but in certain, f certain failure scenarios, you might get the same event more than once. And since we're all Go developers and we love gRPC, uh, and gRPC supports streaming connections, which are like WebSockets, um, we found that really, really cool, and so we wrote a, um, a streaming library. Uh, it's called Reflex. It's also on GitHub, and it's our event streaming. It's our event streaming library, and it's it basically is. It, it's quite simple. It wires together our event streams, which is the source of the events. In this case, our sender, our sender's immutable event table, uh, and it wires together a cursor store. It, which is where, you, where your consumer will just update its cursor, and then the consumer logic itself. Um, and then it supports peer-to-peer -peer streaming via gRPC. So without the need for a central event bus, my service can expose an event stream, and any other service can directly connect to, to my stream and consume it uh, directly. Mm. So for example, in the, in the sender case, the email service can subscribe uh, to completed events. And for every completed event it gets, it can fetch the send uh, and then send an email. Your send was successful. The fraud service can subscribe to pending events um, and then maybe notify somebody uh, if, if they see something that's, that seems risky. And so this is very powerful. Um, because our simple sender state machine doesn't have to be, well, it can stay simple. It can focus on what it does um, while also driving all these other decoupled features and services with its events. And the sender state machine itself actually just subscribes to the stream as, as well. So, it's, so, it, so basically, um, so that implies that there's no external scheduling required um, or orchestration to drive our state machines. Sorry. And what that means that event streams drive state machines that generate events that are streamed to state machines. And this is basically how you would wire it up. So in our sender case, we've got We've got a send stream, uh, and we've got a store. We've got a very like, high-level consumer function, and it basically just filters events that are um, in the pending state. So I only care about pending, um, pending sends, because then we're going to call our send function with, uh, with the ID of the send. And then we just wire it all up. We say go, reflex, consume. We input the send stream, the store, and then uh, the consumer, and you have to give it a name because obviously your cursor, if you're going to store your cursor, you need some kind of identifier, and, and names are also good for metrics. So, um, so that send function is basically our uh, main async processor in, the, in our sender service, and it's going to receive all the sends, it's going to broadcast it on the blockchain, and then it's going to update the state. So we said that the, 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 that the delivery guarantees are at least once. So what does that mean? And how do we handle it? And we handle it by, doing, by, by basically ensuring that all our consumers are idempotent. And what idempotency is, 
it's, it's any operation that if you apply it multiple times, uh, the result doesn't change beyond the initial application. So a good example of this is x is equal to 1. I can just keep on applying x is equal to 1. The answer stays 1. While if I say x plus plus, every time I apply it, my state changes. So if your consumer is idempotent, you can process the same event multiple times. And this does get a bit tricky, obviously, if you have a big consumer in multiple steps, because it can actually fail in the middle. Um, so it actually means that each step in the consumer should be idempotent as well. So looking at our sender consumer, I mean, it's quite simple. Uh, we, get, we get our notification event. It's the ID to the send that's now in the pending state. Um, we'll get it. We'll broadcast it. And then if everything goes well, we'll update the state machine to, from pending to completed. The problem with this is that it's not idempotent. So, I mean, if we process the same send twice, you'll probably get an error on broadcast. I mean, blockchains solve the whole problem of double spend, so you can't spend the same thing twice. And even if we get past that, uh, the, the, our state machine will not allow you to update again from, uh, you're already in the completed state, so you can't go from pending to completed. So if, you, if this function were to process the same send twice, it would just error, and basically this, this consumer would get stuck. It would just get stuck at this point, constantly erroring, retrying. So how do we fix it? Um, oh yeah, so first of all, we just check whether our status, um, our send is in our expected state. We assume it's in the pending state, uh, but so we should just make sure. If it's not, then it's either incompleted and failed, and, and we're actually done, so we can just return. For broadcast, we catch so you should then obviously implement your broadcast function to handle it, but then it throws the error already broadcasted. So then we're happy, and we can just continue. And we have already checked the state, so it, the last one we can just, um, we can just update. So we started with this, and we found that engineers don't really, I mean, we don't like to think about error handling. It's something that comes later. And how often does it really happen? I mean, these theoretical uh, duplicate uh, deliveries, how often does it really happen? Um, and also, with modern cloud environments, my AWS Aurora DB, it's always available. And network issues, how often do they really happen? So, so basically, we had to find a way to, to bring this idea home to bring this theoretical idea of errors that happen in a cloud environment, bring it home, make it concrete. Um, so similar to Netflix's Chaos Monkey idea, we, s we started injecting errors, uh, but not on the infrastructure layer, on the app in the application layer. So the final library for the night is called Fate. And Fate introduces errors into your application by, and, you, and you do that by tempting fate. So here we have our same consumer. Just error handling has been redacted. Um, so we can see after broadcasting, if you're a good developer, you'll tempt fate. And if you're unlucky, you'll get an error, uh, and it'll return. So fate just returns an error sometimes. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't make So it's really just a probabilistic. It just returns an error sometimes. And so what that actually means is that it simulates a partial broadcast failure, um, or it also simulates updating that state machine. And then if you're lucky uh, and fate was on your side, you can continue. You'll update the state machine. And lastly, we'll uh, tempt fate again, just for good measure. And, and this basically simulates uh, duplicate send events um, or actual failure updating the cursor. So this is great. Um, but once again, people don't want to use it. They're like, why do I want to introduce errors into my application logic? So uh, our reflex, our streaming library, will actually tempt fate for you. So it, it feeds you the event. And then if you don't tempt fate, it will tempt fate for itself, um, sometimes causing errors. So 
it's really great. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, it obviously supports configurable error probability, so it's deterministic for tests. We do, a high, we do quite a high probability for staging, meaning that these errors are, are real and often, uh, and for prod, quite a low probability. And what this means is um, stuff now breaks sooner, uh, and it preferably breaks in staging, and, and the big thing is it also breaks in isolation. Because if there's a real network issue, it'll probably affect multiple parts of the system. Uh, and in this case, only the sender will fail, and you can probably fix the bug and make it unimportant. So cool. And that's it. Um, just to recap, this is basically our sender service. We've got, we've got our mutable and immutable tables at the top. We have shift that is doing the state machine, pending failed and completed state. Um, we've got our business logic layer, uh, which will do consumers and basic handling of the API. We've got our gRPC at, at the bottom, and then obviously reflex that does the, that does the event streams. All right, so back to the initial idea. It's a dark and stormy night. But now go for support, sleeping peacefully. Thanks.